Hi, Jonathan Hayashi here. I'm one of the pastoral staff at Troy First Baptist Church in the greater St. Louis area, Missouri. What a joy, what a tremendous privilege and greatest honor for me to be with you here together to study through this incredible book, the Letters to the Hebrews. I'm just so humbled uh, by the invitation by Dead Men to be one of the teaching fellows to go through uh, this series. And uh, I'm just so excited as you know, we, as often I say to my people, you know, we get into the Word so the Word gets into us because we believe the Word of God changes everything. So I'm just so humbled and just kind of as a, such a tremendous joy that we can do this together, that we are able to look to Christ, who's the author and the perfecter of our faith, to help us in time of need, you know, in time such as this. Um, just so you know, I don't know if I have all the right stuff, you know what I'm saying? I don't know if I have all the skills, abilities, homiletics, hermeneutics, all that good stuff. But let me tell you, I know this is the right stuff. So before we dive into the scriptures, I would like you to do one thing. I would like you to pray for me and pray for me as you dive into God's word, as you look to him, as we look for counsel through the entire counsel of God's word as He molds us and nurtures us, conform us more in the likeness of Christ. Let us pray. Father, I'm truly humbled and honored for this opportunity that we're able to look to Your Word. Father, I should be dead amongst all men, but God, thank You for this opportunity that we're able to look to You and that You have caused us by Your grace by faith, to be united to you. Lord, we ask one thing, that you would, uh, you would silence the outer noise of the surrounding and the loud inner noise of our fear that keeps drifting us away from you. Father, help us to listen to that still small voice that says, Come, those who are overburdened and weary, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Father, grant us diligence to seek after you, patience to wait on you, and eyes to behold you, and a life to proclaim you. We pray this in the crucified, resurrected, ascended name, Jesus Christ our Lord, we pray. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 2. Chapter 2, and we're going to start from verse 1 through verse 4. I know the few other uh, brothers have led this study, so I'm just kind of piggyback on that as we dive into it, as we look to, to the holy scripture of this holy moment in a holy edifying time through the Holy Bible. So it says, For this reason, for this reason, we must pay much closer attention to what, have, what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels prove unalterable disobedience, Oh, and forgive me, every transgression and disobedience receive just penalty. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? How? How will we do that? After it was at the first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. May God bless the hearing and the understanding of His Word this time. I like to title the message as the warning against the negligence or neglecting of salvation. You see, there's consequences for us as believers overlooking Christ, and it is atrocious. Despising Christ, Jesus, awaits a terrible aftermath. Let me say it this way, in another way. There's penalties for neglecting Jesus Christ, and that is far too severe. Ignoring Jesus, indeed, has horrible consequences. Before we dive into the portion of verse 1 through verse 4, I'd like to just paint a picture of the background. I remember when I was in Bible college, they said, a text 
out of context, it's with pretext. So for us, in order to really understand and comprehend uh, just what's going on here, we need to understand just a general idea of what's happening. One, one thing that we understand is that the book of Hebrews, we do not know the author. Many scholars interpret whether, you know, it is either Luke or Clement of Rome or Barnabas, Apollos. You know, as pastor, we get anonymous letters, and I don't take those very serious. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, well, if you don't write your name and you're not brave enough to say, you know, I'm just going to toss it out and put it aside. But this letter is different. This letter has been unquestionably been read from the early church in the Second Temple Judaism. People have identified this as indeed the inspired word of God. And if they were satisfied, the fact that the early church received these letters as the inspired authoritative word of God of the scripture, then and the value for Christian discipleship, that should be uh, suffice, that should be a sufficient reason uh, that unquestionable for us. So it doesn't really ultimately matter who wrote the book, but God himself is speaking through the inspired, inerrant, infallible word that is before us. The recipient, uh, what, you know, we, what, what we understand is a second temple, uh, second generation of Christian that's been passed down of the first witness. What do we see? We already saw that in verse 3, right? It's how we escaped this vein and da, 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 after it was in the first spoken through the Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ came and then it was written. Based on that, what we do understand the date that was written, most likely it's around AD 70, but it's probably not then because such a big event would have probably been recorded and written somewhere within, but it didn't happen. But we do understand it's probably during a major persecution was happening. The believers during this time were scattered all over the place and they were perhaps meeting in home churches. They were meeting uh, assemblies and they were reading God's word. And this is an exhortation. Uh, the author's exhorting, encouraging. This, this letter is very dear to the people uh, as we see just in the language of the letter as they were under persecution, a hero, destruction of the temple, AD 70, perhaps happened, perhaps didn't, uh, but, but we know he's urging. The concluding of the chapter, chapter 13, uh, let's take a look at it, 22, verse 22, it says, I urge you to receive this message of exhortation, for I have written to you briefly. If the literary style of Hebrew it's really not like a letter, you see. It's more like a sermonic. It's more like a preaching. It's a sermon. It's really good. That's part of the reason why I probably so love this book. And let me tell you, what makes Hebrew so unique as one of the New Testament epistles is that there's no other book that the New Testament theology and the Old Testament history have been tied in together in focus of Christology. We see Throughout the thread of this book, the supremacy of Christ, the sovereignty of Christ, the greatness of Christ uh, flows through everything. We see what from the beginning it says in chapter 1, which if you were part of our study, I, I would encourage you to go check it out. It says that Christ is greater and superior than angel. Christ is superior than Moses, the prophet. Christ is superior and then the priest, Melchizedek, and then on and on and on. And goes, and we know that, you know, the hall, the, the, and the faith, faith hall of fame that it talks about. And then it talks about how faith working in and through. And that's really what, uh, the, you know, the, the author of Hebrew is urging the believers to do. To, so what? The sermonic character expounds the scripture, the length in order to challenge their truth with their faith faith and their faithfulness. So let's dive in as we look, starting in verse 1. Actually, in fact, let's kind of back up on that, verse 1 through verse 4. If you're reading chapter 1, you would begin to see the similarity or characteristic of chapter 1, verse 1 through 4, and then you see chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. What do you mean by that? You see this point of contrast, but similarity. There's something happening here. There's, a, you know, you, if you were clo close paying attention, if you're reading the whole of Scripture, you would stop and begin to see, huh, this is about Christ. But then it also talks about contrast with angels, right? We already kind of read that uh, in, in later, that Christ is greater than the angels, right? We read uh, in the few of the verses right here. As we have heard, it talks about the Old Testament. I'm not going to dive in there yet, but hang in there uh, as, we, as we look at it. As we play, this, it's just so clear of this tying in together. 
And I'm going to kind of uh, kind of expand on that more as we go in. Now, let's dive into verse 1. It says what? For this reason. For this reason. In another translation, it's like, therefore. So we, in order for us to understand, therefore, we need to understand chapter 1, what's going on, right? So we, we kind of heard that there was the blood of your atonement. We see sanctification of cleansing or purification of the believers. We, we, we see quite a bit in there, chapter 1, uh, verse 1, through all the way through verse 14. I encourage you to read that in order for you to really understand what's happening in verse 2. We are not able to understand, in this view, another translation, for this reason, as Natsby said, is the instance of a clause. It's so necessary for us to understand in view of what God has done. What is that? is that Jesus Christ was sent for God so loved the world that he sent his son. In that, in John chapter 3, in the Johannine literature, what we say is that for God so loved the world, he sent his son, which means that he also put him on the cross. So, so it, this is what Christ has done on behalf of those the elect, those who are predestined, those who are within the covenant of the family of the church, of the ecclesia. So in order to drive that home of this, the Son of God over angels, we see. He is over angels, verse 1 through verse 4. The writer urges the reader to respond, respond, respond to the gospel, respond to the cross, respond to the greatness of Christ. After of such exaltation of recognizing who Jesus is and his work and who he is, of his messiahship, of the doctrine of Messiah, this was a problem. You see, the author sold there was an oxymoron. It was kind of like a compartmentalized Christianity. It seemed like there was a false dichotomy that they understood the doctrine, yet they didn't live in their life. What do you mean by that, Jonathan? Hang in there. Come on and join with me again. As we see, they were not committed themselves to Jesus. They were not committed to God the Lord. They recognized Him as Savior, yet not king of their life and this is an issue the passage begins to fully begin to go through the series uh, just so you know if you're reading through the book of hebrews you begin to see this is the first part that starts a warning sign what do you mean by that chapter three uh, chapter two starts with one warning sign then chapter three then chapter four and chapter five and then chapter six and chapter ten uh, these series of of warning you just see this again and again and again and again See, the author was very, very concerned for the believers, the recipient, the audience, the immediate audience that was happening. And I think that could apply to us as well, right? So there's something here that we see uh, a care and an urgency, right? I remember when I was in seminary, uh, when a Greek and Hebrew professor said, students, Greek and Hebrew is like underwear. It's good for support, but not good for show off, right? But in order for us to really understand, like, it's like, what's going on? Why is he repeating over and over and over to repeat? It's because he's saying, hey, check this out. Highlight it, underline it, put a scribble on it, maybe put a star on it. This is so important. Check it out. That's what he's saying. Therefore, this reason, pay attention to what I'm saying. And what is he paying attention to? This is what's happening. He says, hold fast to to, to put into attention, closer attention, to what we have heard. About what? what? Who Christ is and what Christ has done. Yes, God the Father, the Advocate, through the Son, the Mediator, and the Spirit dwelling within our hearts. The importance of the author's concern. What's going on? What's happening? Here's the heart of it. The belief of the believers of that time didn't tie into their behavior. What do you mean? Their perception tied into their practice. Okay, I think I'm getting it. Their theology didn't tie into the methodology of their practical Christian discipleship of their everyday living of life. Does that sound somewhat familiar? Maybe you know some people like that. And he comes boldly, you see the audacity of God, the audacity here. You must believe even more the truth. And you may say, well, I did that. I prayed that. I know it. I come to church every week. Thank you, God. My attendance sheet, I'm good to go. See, this is the thing though. Your belief changes everything, right? Your belief is not just some kind of theoretical idea that you do within your intellectual mind. See, 
the author of Hebrew is getting at something. He's saying that if you truly believe it's going to change the way you interact with one another, it changes the way that you practice your life, it changes the way how you relate to one another, it changes the way that you feel within your heart. It's everything, isn't it? And as he begins to break it down, as you begin to see, he says this. Are you ready? He says, God has said to you through Christ, otherwise, otherwise, listen, watch this. You are in danger that you may lose your salvation, lose your faith. You're almost saved, but you're not quite saved. Whoa, 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 wait up. So you're telling me. So I prayed a prayer and but I'm going to lose my salvation? Is that what you're saying? Or are you saying the perseverance of the saints is not a reality anymore? It's kind of like, bam, bam, you're gone? Is that what you're saying? No, nope. okay, that's not what I'm saying. Maybe you listened to the conversation that had theology and nice, justification by faith alone. So we truly believe that there's perseverance of the saint. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Of course, absolutely. It's sola fide, faith alone, sola gratia, grace alone, sola Christus, Christ alone, sola scriptura on the basis of scripture alone, and soli deo gloria, to God be the glory. Absolutely, no denial of that. We say by grace, through faith, in Christ, on the basis of scripture, so we give God the glory alone. But check this out. But if, you know, a lot of times people hold on to perseverance as saints. You know, we call that in the reform circle, in the Calvinistic, it's tulip, which T stands for total depravity, U is unconditional election, L is limited atonement, I is irresistible grace, and then perseverance of the saints. A lot of denominational lines hold on to that alone. <laughs> we call it like the one point Calvinist, right? Um, but they want to hold on to, to that with their life because, yeah, I did the prayer, I'm good to go. And I'm not denying that. And in fact, later on, you're going to learn that in Hebrews chapter 6. Again, there's four different major interpretations. And, and I'm going to leave that to the other teaching fellow who's going to break that down. Uh, but it's kind of worth looking into because, you know, depending on the, uh, you know, uh, the figures that you're learning, like John Calvin or Charles Spurgeon, or you know maybe the, some of the newer guys, there's different interpretation. Like the newer guys are John MacArthur or John Piper. Uh, it would just be worth looking at. But we're we don't have enough time right now, so we're going to kind of put down the backside of it. So a lot of times when people hold on to perseverance as a saint, they totally forgot the total depravity of their sin. You see that that we are totally depraved even within our mind and our life and everything. We cannot save ourselves by our own works, by our own merit, by our own virtue, by anything, but only by the strong, eternal, immutable work of Jesus Christ that is in it, it been enacted by His grace and freely given by His amazing mercy. See, that no doubt, but this, okay, so that we got that right. So a lot of times people do not see how amazing grace is because they don't see how terrible their sin is, right? They don't think grace is so great because their sin is not so great. But that's the reality. If you want to truly understand grace, you got to see where wrath is, where wrath and grace meet together. That's Jesus at the cross. That's substitution atonement. That's justification. That's penal substitution. That's perpetuation, right? That's actually what's talking about in chapter 3 later as well. Um, but, but all these things that we understand, we want to justify ourselves, but we don't want sanctification in our life because, because that means it's going to change everything we want in our life, doesn't it? right? But this is a reality. If you're not changed by grace, you're probably not saved by grace. Let me say that again. If you're not changed by grace, you're probably not saved by grace. Because the tip of your tongue reveals what is, what, what reveals within the heart of the treasure. Because the fruit of your life reveals the root of your heart. It's all tied in together. So what I'm saying is that, no, I'm not saying that, okay, well, because you're not working out, well, that sounds legalistic, that's not what I'm saying. But your sanctification, it does not provide your justification, but your sanctification is going to prove your justification. In fact, John Calvin in the Four Institution talked about that. He never intended justification and sanctification to be separated. He who has begun a good work will complete it. So, so if God's grace begins to work within your life, you're going to continue in a trajectory to become more Christ-like. That's in fact the word Christianity comes from, right? Christian. 
the Christian life is all about Christ and that's what the book of Hebrews is talking about. So when we begin to see that, we're going to begin to see how terrible of a scenario we are and that we could never save ourselves but Christ in His infinite glorious riches of His grace by the power of the resurrection and the, and, and, and the spirit of the empowering, we begin to live not because we want to earn something but because of grace. See religion says, I obey therefore I am accepted but the gospel says, I am accepted therefore I obey. It's the other way around. The gospel totally counter culture and flips everything around. So J.C. Ryle, he said it well like this, ones who have experienced truly the amazing, immeasurable, unconditional love of Jesus. J.C. Ryle says this, Never does a person see the beauty of Christ as Savior until they discover that they are lost and ruined sinner. The author reminds the people the importance of the message of Jesus. Is Jesus more than anything that you ever needed within your life? Or it, do you want everything in the other world and then Jesus is somewhere there in the back? Is Jesus truly Lord everything over your life? Or is He King over all, all your life? See, Jesus is not just Savior so you can get a fire insurance. Jesus is King, you see. And if if there's a king, then there's a kingdom. And if there's a kingdom, then there are citizens. And this is the question. This is a fundamental question. The question is, are you an active participant or are you a passive civilian in the kingdom? And that's pretty much what he's breaking down here in chap uh, you know, chapter 2, verse 1. He said, pay close attention if you heard, and that we may drift away. Oh, man. I remember one time. I remember one time I was on a kayak and it was my one of my PE classes in high school. I was going with my buddy. We were kind of playing around, but I totally forgot, you know, I don't know what that thing that you call, you kind of close the canoe, uh, the kayak, uh, but I totally forgot to put that in because we were just having way too much fun. We were drifting away. We were going to go to this island, but long story short, uh, we, we, we were paddling and we were splashing waters. Halfway to the island, and we're in the middle of the ocean, this is Southeast Asia, by the way, in Malaysia. We start sinking. We're panicking. I was like, oh, do we get rid of the kayak of the ball? And there's a bunch of jellyfish. I think I got stung like six times. It was terrible. But, but, <laughs> but by God's grace, he sent the PE teacher. He swam all the way halfway. And then he picked us up. And he got the ball. And he carried us all the way there. See, that's the imagery that we see drifting away, drifting apart from the harbor of salvation, that we don't get to the destination. We started on the right foot. We started with the right theology of the Messiah, of the gospel of the risen Christ. The gospel that King Jesus came, died, rose again, so that whoever believed, repent, and follow Him may have supreme joy in Christ for eternity for the kingdom of God. So let me ask you a question. Have you drifted away from the faith? Have you drifted away from where you've started? Like, let's say, let, let's look back and when you first encountered Jesus. And the first time you came and loved the scriptures and treasure Him above everything. Have you, where's your heart at? Where is the affection of your heart? Have you, have your heart drifted apart from your Lord Jesus Christ? Maybe you're saying, yeah, Jonathan, actually, um, I remember in vacation Bible school, I gave my life to Jesus. I remember in youth camp, um, I had this emotional high and Jesus was really, really real. But man, life happened. I went to college, went to high school, did show choir activities, joined a football team and hung out with my friends, began to do stuff like them. And it seemed like a distant shore, a distant memory. If people were to ask me, nobody would even know if they were to look at my life because I live just like the world. I echo what the author of Hebrews is saying. Beware, beware, beware. Beware where you're walking, my friends. It's not like a flu shot. You see, you get it, you're good to go. See, the Christian life is all our life. It's not a compartmentalized Christianity, even like maybe going once a week and then you live just like the world. You, you're entertained by the world, by Netflix and social media, and then you do all the things of the world, the sports and activity, but you don't have time for Jesus and you drift away. You walk like the pattern of this world. 
you're in danger of losing of your faith. You're almost saved, but you're not quite there, you see, because it is evident through your lifestyle and your choices. Grace, when it comes in your life, it wrecks and changes. This gospel beckons us to abandon everything within our dreams and treasures and our lives in the future. Because this gospel beckons to give our lives in total abandonment, total radical obedience to Christ. Let me just read what David Platt said. I love what he said. He says, we would not wish, talking about the absent from the body, present with the Lord, uh, in the eschaton of the eternity with Christ. Uh, we would not wish that we had more money, acquired more stuff, lived more comfortably, taken more vacations, watched more televisions, pursued greater retirement, and been more successful in the eyes of the world. Instead, instead, we will wish that we have given more to our uh, uh, more to Christ and not ourselves and our lives and that one day that nation, every nation, tongue, people in every language will bow around the throne of God, praise our Savior, delight in radical obedience, a blaze in adoration, the God who deserves eternal worship. See, this is the idea of drifting away. You are in danger. You're not in danger of losing your reward in heaven. You're in danger of hell. Work on your salvation with fear and trembling, I urge you as, as a friend to turn to Christ, repent, to seek Him with all your heart. But God, God, not just with our hearts, but the, the, the rocky shore of the raging rapid, that we would come back to Him in our trials and the tribulation and suffering. It doesn't mean that God is going to fix all your problems and make life fine and dandy. And we're not talking about the prosperity gospel, that God's love is determined by your wealth, health, comfort. But God is going to use you for His own glory, encompassing His glory to be reflecting to the nations and to focal point, to display to the glory to the nation so that He may receive all the glory. That's the Christian life, you see. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about the world. It's all about Christ Jesus and Him enthroned on and for eternity on the King, the Lamb of God, which was slain and seated upon the right hand of God. See, King Jesus desires everything. In fact, He deserves everything. So what is your life? What is your life, my friends? There's no more playing around this game, sitting around playing you know, normal, mere, intellectual, casual Christianity. This gospel is total abandonment. Every dream, every possession, every single thing, surrender in the purpose of Christ. That's what it's talking about. But, but we would say, well, it doesn't really matter because I've done it with my head. See, this is a thing though. Every believer is obedient and only those who obey truly believe. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that. So it's not a false dichotomy like our conversion and our discipleship. It's not divorced from one or the other. See, the Christian life encompasses and changes in trajectory and we begin to live. So what kind of gospel are you talking about? What kind of gospel? That the gospel that drives and in, in, enthrones and transforms and changes into in the Christ likeness as we center around the person and the work of Jesus in the cross. That's the true assurance that we are living as we pay attention to the plight as the writer says as you less carelessly fall into ruin fall into destruction fall into the path of damnation again i kind of broke it down just earlier you know verse 2 talks about the law it talks about the law that received the divine judgment of disobedience see this is the thing though jesus christ became the fulfillment of the law. He said the law and the prophet witnessed to him the, the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Elijah and, and Moses pointing to Christ, looking to him. Jesus himself became the answer to all things. See, we don't have a law, but we have something way greater, way supreme, way superior to all things. And then we neglect and then we ignore. We put it in the back burner and say, yeah, that's for like super Christians. But in reality, it beckons for every ordinary Christians taking the extraordinary message of the gospel in radical obedience in changing, altering everything, transforming our hearts and our lives. See, this is a thing like the Puritans said, or cognition and our affection or volition is all tied in together, right? So, or 
or knowing of who God is and our being of our identity and our flowing of our doing of our action, it's not one or the other, right? See, that's the reality that we need to be reminded. That's the reason when we preach, we inform the mind and then we ignite the heart and we invite the will. And that's what the book of Hebrew and the author is doing again and again and again and again. He's warning, he's urging, he's causing them. And we'll say, well, Jonathan, again, that's like the law. I don't matter. Again, it doesn't matter. We're talking about Christ, God's son, who brought the gospel himself and embrace and clothe us right in the doctrine of expiation and imputation of righteousness we're clothed in his righteousness we heard that right and submerged by the blood of christ and in the atonement on the road of calvary we are marked by heaven above not of this earth anymore we are sojourners this life no longer belongs to us this is not our home we are looking to christ and we're every way tools of his divine instrument of this peace and we're turning and looking to the glory of god the verse three continues how will we escape of this neglect of the great salvation great of a salvation right great of salvation we're talking about salvation that changes our lives you know sometimes people are like well i got that and it doesn't change my life well this is the thing if we are just people of salvation maybe we should have called ourselves sortirions in greek sortiriology the study of salvation but we are not right we are the people of the gospel which is the word from the greek euangelion the gospel evangelical means the gospel that we embrace changes everything. This is the reality. We need the whole gospel through the whole church to the whole world. And I believe we just have a deficiency. It's not God's fault. It's not God's word's fault. We have a deficiency of the word of God because we're not turning to it and obeying what King Jesus has called us to live. And we enthrone ourselves in self-indulgence and self-exaltation rather than letting Christ letting us be crucified with Christ and letting Christ rule our throne of life and desires our hearts, our minds, and our intellect and everything. And we say, God, this is my life. That's not the reality. The Lordship of Jesus Christ, who's superior than angels, superior than prophets, superior than priests, superior than all things, even the law, calls us and beckons us to live in obedience to Him. That's reality, how we measure a true growth of a maturity of Christ. That we begin to, in likeness of Christ, and begin to live in conformity of Christ, begin to transform in the likeness of Christ. It is all about Christ. The Christian life is all about Christ, you see. It's all about Jesus as we begin to live. I love what Charles Spurgeon, the Prince of Preacher, said here. Let me just read it really briefly. There is no glory in God, but what is also in Christ, whatever God is, Christ is. Who would dare to turn his back on him? If this is God's ambassador who comes clothed in the crimson of a robe of his own blood redeemed humanity, who will refuse this peace he brings? It is not humanity who will refuse the peace he brings. It is not a wonderful thing that you made purification for our sins even before we had committed them. Oh, there they stood before the sight of God as already existent in all their hideousness. The sweepers of the street and the dishwashers of the kitchen, the cleansers of this, the sewers of the honorable work compared to this. Yet the holy Christ, incapable of sin, stopped to make purification for our sin. See, the gospel came to you. So, so, It'll go to somebody else. This gospel, this life, is not for ours to keep. This gospel, Jesus gave to our life, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His Son. He didn't only give His Son, He gave Him on the cross so that He would send us to the world. So what are you doing? How are you living in obedience to what Christ has done? I urge you, he who has ears, do not harden your heart. Let us turn to Him in obedience to Christ. That by the means of grace, through the reading of Scripture, through prayer, through the communion of the saints, through the local church, do not abandon that obedience of what we have been entrusted, what we have been the stewards and the managers of time, talent, treasure, to look to Christ, to point to Christ, to live for Christ, to worship Christ, to exalt Christ. That is what it is. Why should you listen to Jesus? It's obvious. Because the penalty of ignoring neglecting him is eternal consequence unless we have christ we have fell a final judgment consequence or eternal 
We must listen to Jesus and His message as we will then escape the pangs of eternal death and experience in our lives in mercy and faithfulness to Jesus Christ. To Him be your glory. And may God bless you and keep you. And may His peace and countenance shine upon you and give you peace and grace and mercy to stay. Lord bless you. Lord be with you and walk with them. For the penalty of disobedience is too severe. Let us turn to Christ. Lord, have mercy.